and welcome, and we will start with a bracha. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshana B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. Amen. Amen. And here goes with the screen share. And you may recollect that yesterday we were looking at Torah Tmima, at the actual comment on it, and the issue of why the text only talks about taking revenge on the Midianites and doesn't mention the Moabites, which is very interesting, right? And we discussed possibilities. So this gets the scholars thinking about why. Why would the text go that route? <clears throat> and one of the answers we had was that uh, Ruth was destined, you know, great-grandmother of King David was destined to descend she was a Moabitess, we know that. And there was also Naamah the Ammonite who, who came, uh, who was the na a named wife of King Solomon. And uh, in the, in the uh, Torah Tmima, he quoted uh, a uh, Yalkut Shemoni that was really interesting, which, which uh, riffed on the fact that it says Nikum Nikmat. In other words, it said vengeance twice. And, and the explanation given by the Yalkut Shmoni was that, in fact, it did include the Moabites, that even though the Torah explicitly states the Midianites, the Moabites indeed were to be also, uh, there was revenge against the Moabites by divine command. And um, as a matter of fact, but what happened was it was held up until Ruth was descended. And then after King David was born, then now that that had been paid, so to speak, um, they, they could, in, in fact, take revenge on the Moabites. But it had to wait until that point. And, and that it was a very interesting sort of curious, curious um, derivation that we had. And we didn't finish the entire section with the uh, Torah Tamima. We got there. Okay. So we, we're going back a little bit because this is the beginning of his next idea, right? So when it says hikshu, it means that the tosafot, this is, of course, this is a major, uh, I don't want to call it a commentary because it gives the wrong impression. What the tosafot do is they take it a step further. They, in a sense, continue the Talmudic kind of discourse. So Rashi is there to explain, but the Tosafot are there to take these ideas and develop them even further. And uh, I'm not to say that they don't sometimes do explanations, but that isn't their point. Um, I had a wonderful Talmud teacher when I was in at rabbinical school, uh, Ben Sion Wachholder, who, who made the point that very often the Tosafot came up with what is called, I guess, legally novellae. Novellae are new laws that you derive from what you've got. You come up with completely new ideas, and that's a lot of what the Tosafot were doing. And there are a number of them. They essentially were Rashi's grandchildren. Rashi's grandchildren. Uh, you know the story behind that. Why not Rashi's sons? Rashi had no sons. He was blessed with daughters. But as all good daughters do, they married rabbis. So their children were, in fact, scholars, etc. Uh, so, so the Tosafot raised an objection, right? Uh, this is the deb debate, right? It's a debate. Mimanda Amar Midrash Rabbah, from what is, I believe that's what this abbreviation refers to, right? From what is said in Midrash Rabbah, De Kesheshalach David et Yoav El Aram Naharayim, that when David, this is, of course, later on in the second book of Samuel, that's where you'll find a lot of the narratives of King David uh, about his reign, that he sent Yoav, his chief general, to Aram Naharayim. Aram Naharayim generally is understood, he said Aram of the two rivers is understood as Mesopotamia, the El Aram Tsova. And my understanding is that Aram Tsova refers to the area north of Israel, which is like uh, Syria, that general area. Paga, so when he sent Yoav to those areas, Yoav Pagab Moavim, he, he encountered, he encountered Moabites, Uvikesh Abdan, and he sought to destroy them. 
והביאו לו אסטראות, and the Moabites brought him documents, he translates that as תעודות, would mean like certificates, right? שלהם, that they owned, אל תצר את מואב, which stated, you shall not pursue Moab. This is, I believe, in Deuteronomy, you'll find that phrase. They had those. They shiv David, and here we go, and David uh, re responded, Shehem pirtsu ged el tchila, that they uh, contravened that to begin with. That they they went back on that concept. Why? Dichtiv vayishlach malachim el bilam, etc. Because the Moabites um, sent, uh, or excuse me, uh, the Midianites sent uh, um, messengers to Bilam. I think though it says vayigar Moab. So um, there's some, something's not con computing for me here, but at any rate, they sent, the, the Moabites sent, it was the Moabites who sent the messengers to Bil'am, umashma, and the implication is, hutar, that since they had backed out on this deal, that there was this, uh, this mutual agreement that they would not pursue one another, or trouble one another, since they backed down on the deal to begin with, the deal was null and void. That was David's argument. The Tirzu and uh, the uh, Tosafot uh, resolve, resolve this difficulty. The Dechuya Ba'alma Heshiv, that in fact, this is not a compelling argument, that this uh, argument on David's part was not a compelling argument, etc. Vechule Ad Kan Lashono. And this is uh, a this is the end of the quote. Dati, and in my humble opinion, this is uh, Baruch Chalevi Epstein saying, Zedocha. Uh, it is it is a pushing. It's a pushed argument. Aval uh, ha'emet, but in truth, in truth. Ki af al pi shat hayalkut anal, okay, that since the Yalkut Shimoni has given this explanation that we just referred to above, mevuar, it becomes clear, bepshitut meod, in a very clear sense, darak ad shenolda rut kayam hatsivui, that in fact, it was only up until the birth of Ruth that this commandment, al tatsir et moav, you shall not trouble moav, uh, was established. Umimele, and, and obviously automatically, be made David in the, in the, during the days of David, utar, it became released. They commit the dok, and he says, I believe this, this means, uh, I, it could mean uh, QED. So that's so. There's some interesting stuff going beyond the uh, the pshat that we read initially. There's another another interesting. I think you. I hope you'll enjoy another one. And it's so. So the the verse. Let's go back at the verse and say right. Uh, God, Hashem spoke to Moses saying, uh, "Avenge right the revenge of the children of Israel." from the Midianim, from the Midianites, and afterwards, afterwards, you shall be gathered to your people. So, afterwards, you will be gathered. So, we, you all understand, obviously, what he's referring to, right? He's saying, that's going to be it for you. Amar Rabbi Yitzchak, said Rabbi Yitzchak, itur sofrim halacha lamoshe misinai. He says, so itur refers to a garland or a wreath of the scribes, is halacha la Moshe Misinai, meaning a very uh, established halacha, going all the way back to, to Moses at Mount Sinai. So if you're unfamiliar with this expression, it's worth exp explaining that there are certain laws that are accepted as halacha that are not mentioned anywhere in the Torah explicitly, or perhaps not even implied, but are understood as halakha la Moshe Sinai, meaning as accepted halakha, that it has the same status 
as Torah, as the written Torah. It simply isn't, it's simply a tradition that has been preserved with the Jewish people that wasn't written in the Torah. There've been, there's been quite a bit of discussion uh, going back quite a bit uh, in terms of what the what it really means, why why this particular expression, I believe that there is one interpretation that says that when it talks halacha la Moshe misinai, because there may be I'm guessing here certain halachot that come under this category that perhaps are mentioned, um, that it refers to halacha where there's no disagreement amongst the sages. Um, what is a garland? of the scribes. Have to... uh, yes, I'll explain that. Uh, well, it'll, it'll become clear, I'm hoping, right? So be patient and I will, I will definitely, if I don't answer that question, you push me on it again, okay? So he says, that expression, and following this, you will be gathered, itur sofrimhu. It is an example of a scribal garment, garland, a scribal wreath. So let's, this is, of course, begging further explanation, as, as you indicated. So here he goes, itur sofrim, okay, nikra. So this expression, itur sofrim, this garland, this wreath of scribes, is called tevat yeterot, added words shenichtavu that are written so this is an expression to describe uh words that are are uh, additional in other words that when it says yeterot it means unnecessary right that they're um redundant in a sense redundant words that are written leyapot halashon in order to beautify the language in other words it it makes what you're reading sound better. The nikraot itur, and the reason they're called a garland or a wreath, the fishahen me'atrin etalashon, because in fact, they take the language and make it sound better. So for example, when you say you're going to sleep and you use the expression, you're going into the arms of Morpheus, that would be an example of that, although that isn't, of course, necessarily redundant. And here we are talking about certain redundancies. We might be including that idea. Come on. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so you're basically saying that it's embellishments that aren't necessary. Mm -hmm. okay. Correct. Correct. Got it. Thank yes, you. Exactly right. Well, well said. Well said. Thanks, David. Come on. For example, right here. Achar te asaif. The example of Acharte say, following this, you will be gathered. The Haya if Sharlichtov, because it's it it follow it it comes into this category because it could it was possible to write Vate Asaif. And it just it didn't need to use the word achar afterwards. It could have just said, you know, avenge the is take revenge on the part of Israelites against the Midianites, and you will then um, you know, and then you will. Um, you will be gathered to your people. And sorry, and be gathered to the people. Don't even need and then. Okay, at least you certainly don't in the Hebrew. But I say, and you will be gathered to your people. The Chatav Achar, the Achar, he used the word, he used the word Achar, and afterwards, the Tif Eret Halashon, for as, as an embellishment of the language. So, so understand that when he says this, just this very word, achar, and afterwards, is not necessary, but it's there to make it a little softer and make the language flow a little better. And the point about this is, and the point is that this is considered in other words, including this word, achar, right? The necessity to include this word, achar, which is nothing more than this embellishment, halacha uh, Moshe Sinai, is considered an established law for asur l'shanot mizeh, and you cannot read it any other way. You cannot change this expression. So just some, some this, this little piece, understanding, first of all, this expression, halacha l'moshe Sinai is an important expression 
to kind of remember, okay? And also itur sofrim, this notion of itur sofrim as we try to analyze the language, the language of, you know, any language, but in this particular case, of course, the Hebrew of scripture. Well, there are, I mean, first of all, there are lots of examples of um, superfluity um, and or adornment. And I say and or because sometimes it's really not considered adornment. Agreed. And sometimes adornment may not be superfluous. But how, I don't know how you leap from that to um, the halakha aspect of it and what's halakhic that's being described here. Okay, so what's halakhic is the fact that I, I believe that the point that's being made here is how important it is. To call it halakha la Moshe Misenai is saying that this particular tradition carries a great deal of weight. You mean the adornment or, yes. or the, it has nothing to do with um, the being gathered up to, you know, after the warring with the Midianites. It, it, it's just the language, Correct. it's halakha to use adorning language well in this that this specific example for example and it's an example and and lauren i totally agree with you there are many examples um where there are unnecessary words and they are not necessarily adornment but this is a case of superfluity for the sake of adornment in other words we're not necessary we'll, we'll see um if there's any other interpretations, but it's possible, it's possible as we're sort of thinking about this, uh, that, that, you know, pretty much every other example that I've given you where there's superfluity, there's been a specific drush that's come out of it. You know, I mean, this is like the, the very foundation of Midrash, of, this, of the Midrashic process. Uh, but here it is not, I think is the point he's making. Then he, I, I really don't understand the point. The, the point is that it, it's that important, that, that, un, that when the Torah uses that kind of language, it's important. So having, having the language, making sure that the language is, is beautified, part of that, right, is an important principle. I mean, it really <laughs> well, stretches my credulity to find okay, that. Okay, I think it's just there. about, and then you will die, as opposed to, you'll, you will just, you'll die. As soon as it's right. over, that's you better. mean you mot versus? Yeah, it, I think it's just that we should say nice. You know, but when people are about to die, we're supposed to be nicer to them. I, I don't know that, yeah, I mean, I don't know that it's a, the specific case, right? If that would I be halakha, yes, yes, it would. You know, I would think, I would think that that's trying to, you know, making making that type of a statement. Yeah. Anytime you would make that type of a statement. Mm -hmm. What is halakha except for things that we should do also? Okay, and, and on, the other, on the other side of things, I'm wondering if it has exactly to do with this point that we're trying to make, that he's saying here, the, the reason for the superfluity is, is not to come and drush it out, but it is simply to, to make the language sound better, okay, to, to beautify the language, and that, 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 that is, an, in fact, an important concept as part of the Torah, you know, as part of how the Torah is written. Now, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going out on a limb, and maybe I've got the wrong point here, but Golda, I agree with you. I appreciate your explanation. Lauren, if you're able to feel a, more comfortable given Golda's explanation, uh, then I'm certainly grateful. But I'm not sure what, what's the problem you're having here. If well, I mean, if, with Golda's explanation, I guess that's a little bit less tenuous, but I don't understand, first of all, what's beautiful about Athar. I mean, whether it's superfluous well, or not, I mean, that doesn't necessarily make it a dormant, but I, I just don't, you know, and if they're trying to use one obscure, you know, superfluity to say, well, this is a dormant and to say, well, if it's adornment that means it's halakha it would seem like it like what Golda said it would have to be attached to something practical I mean what 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 else you know what what are they pointing out as halakha they have to be pointing out something as halakha wouldn't they well I don't think they're pointing out a halakha per se except if the halakha is is that when the Torah writes in this particular way it 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 it, it shouldn't be changed 
Um, incidentally, I think, and I mean, the sense that I understand this is, of course, he's telling Moses something pretty awful, all right? And, and God is telling him, he's saying, you know, take care of this, you have this mission, and you're going to die. And, and softening that, I mean, I agree with gold in the sense that it is an example of where under certain circumstances, you, you want to be sensitive uh, to what's going on here. And again, maybe it's, it's a way of telling us that the sensitivity isn't, um, you know, it, it's not just happen chance. It's, it's a considered thing. It, it has some gravitas to it. So, uh, and maybe I'm missing the point here, but that's the sense that I have. Who knows? <laughs> I mean, it says Latif Eret Well, was there, there, there argument in the time language. period that maybe we should just take that word out? Maybe that it was a mistake that somebody stuck it in because, you know, that, that happens. Yes. Or it could be one of those, you know, put a star next to it or right. something. Maybe there that's was a discussion true. on that. Maybe there was, and that's true yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. Because it's his statement that says it, it cannot be changed, right? For Asur le Shanot Mizeh. We right. Can, we cannot change it, which is, as it were, the halacha, that, you're, that you must do it, you know, that it has to be written this particular way. So, uh, uh, could be. I'm, I'm ready to move on. We can try a little bit. We've got in the next one. So here we go. Achar ta'asef. And following that, you will be gathered. Lohodia shivchan she'parnase Yisrael. This is to let you know that this statement that we're reading, this verse, right, is to inform you, Lohodia, Shivchan, the praise, right, the greatness of Parnasse Yisrael, the, the leaders of the Jewish people, okay? She'en niftarin min ha'olam, that they, they do not depart the world. Ad she'en noknim nok uh, min nikmat Yisrael, until they avenge the wrongs done to the Jewish people. Because in fact, taking, avenging that is in fact doing the, finding the, 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 um, the vengeance. I wanted to find a different word from that. The one who said, and the world came into existence, which of course is a nice way of referring to, to God. So in a way, it's saying it's saying that on the that from the point of view of the leaders of Israel, they feel a responsibility to take care of the wrongs that are done to the Jewish people, and to make sure that they uh, take care of that that it's one of the most important things that they do. Uh, I think this is being literary. We shouldn't be over literal about it. But we can take a look and see what um, what uh, uh, Baruch Halevi Epstein has to say about it. And I'm going to, because it's 7:55, I'm going to stop here and make a marking uh, that that's where we're going to go next time. We'll start there. Uh, so next, maybe uh, it's not just because of the word achar, but also for gathering. Because yes. because it talked about when it talked about the scribes and the garland, it talked yes. about a yes. gathering of scribes, and maybe this what you just read about having to finish protective work mm -hmm. before you're gathered up. Maybe the gathering is pointing to that as the halacha. Um, no, I don't think so. Honestly, I, I really think they're talking about the use of the language in that particular way, that that's mm -hmm. really the point that they're talking about. I don't, I don't remember talking about the gathering of scribes. First, I thought I heard you say that word in one of the- uh... No, 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 I don't think so. Okay. Put the garland in the yeah. thing. In garland I heard, yes. The yes. garland yeah. you absolutely heard, absolutely. Yes. I'm gonna mm -hmm. stop the share here and we can stop the recording. Mm. Give you a chance just to thank the people who are perhaps watching this recording or listening to it.